when something is so mouthwateringly juicy, so satisfyingly crispy, so perfectly hand-breaded that you just want it all to yourself? You don't have to share, but it'd be a lot cooler if you did. The new Zaxx Pack for two. With eight chicken fingers, double the fries, two drinks, and that world-famous Zaxx sauce. Twice the flavor for just $14.99. Only at Zaxby's. Try it with fried pickles for a limited time. Order ahead, drive through, or get it delivered. From Tally to Cali, it's time to wake up. Wake up, wake up, wake up. Wake up. Warchant.com is your ultimate seminal sports source. And this is Wake Up Warchant, presented by Zaxby's. Now here's Warchant.com's Aslan Hunchavandi and Corey Clark. Wake up! What's up, everybody? It's Wake Up Warchant, proudly presented by Zaxby's, indescribably good. This is take number five of the show. It's going to be a great Monday. Before we begin, small favor... If you're listening to this on YouTube, if you could hit that little subscribe button, apparently, you know, we're going to live in a world, well, actually, we won't be around for it, Corey. Brady will be. Maybe even, uh, you know, his, his son, your grandson, granddaughter, perhaps. We'll live in a world where uh, they're all sort of judged on weird log, not logarithms, algorithms. And uh, hey, do you want to try to take? Do you want to try to take six? Or are we good now? We're good. We're, we're going to power okay. through this. We're, going, we're powering through this. We're powering okay. through it, Corey. Um, yeah, subscribe to our YouTube channel, folks. If you could, if you're listening on YouTube, uh, even if you're not, if you want to jump over there and uh, the, uh, hit that button, that'd be great. Apparently, we're judged on that uh, in the world that we live in right now. So it's free, and then you can customize it to where you get your alerts on certain things. So you won't. I'm not trying to blow your folks up here with a bunch of uh, notifications and stuff on your phone and emails. Just hit a little button, and then uh, you know, customize when you want to get alerted when this show drops. When Michael Langston drops some Langston bombs in terms of recruiting, when we do roundtables, all that stuff, it's available for you. So uh, if you could, do that for your boy. Our boy, though, is Corey Clark. What's up, man? How are you? Sorry about all that. It's all right, buddy. I'm good. I'm good. I'm uh, back in Tallahassee. Feels good. Feels good to be home again. All right. Uh, We did have a question after I posted the show on Friday from our buddy Rob Clifton a.k.a. Nubs Up. He wants us to DM him our addresses because he has something he wants to mail to us. I don't know how legit that is. I was going to kind of maybe see what you thought about that. But anyhow, he he really wanted to know how Brady's been doing, and he thinks that it's time that we bring Brady back onto the program. Uh, It might be time. Uh, He just turned 12. I think he's old enough now to really appreciate the moment and uh, honor the show. Um, and yeah, I'm, I mean, what I think we should do is maybe give them your address and both things could be delivered to you. Oh, okay. I'll, I'll take it. I'll, I'll dive on the grenade for the team. I see. I, yeah, see I mean, it's the do. Midtown offices, right? Yeah. Um, we'll see each other again at some point, I guess. Right. At some point. Yeah. You're here. You're in Tallahassee. Don't, don't be scared. Well, yeah, but what are we going to go do? Hang out at a bar? Definitely not, but we can hang out within six feet of each other. We can do physical activities like tennis and golf, which I look you forward right. to. You're right. Yeah, so maybe we'll uh, maybe we'll do that while I'm while I'm in town. Uh, yeah. But yeah, Brady's doing well. Uh, didn't have his best baseball tournament this past weekend, but hey, it's all right. He's still still a good player. He just had a tough 0 for four. He was he 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 wasn't uh, wasn't very happy after the 0 for four. And he broke. More importantly, he broke his bat. Oh, which is a very expensive. Bat. <laughs> well, just because it's 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 our the Clark luck sometimes. Uh, you know he bats lead off now, which I told him he was all upset. Like he 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 started the season batting last because he was so bad in the fall, and now he's bats either first, second, or third on his team. They put him at lead off because um, he he leads the team and runs and stolen bases and everything. Hey, by the way, he cracked the forty stolen base barrier this weekend. Let's go. Yeah. So he's now he's got 41 steals. So I told him he's only 39 homers away from the 40 40 club. Um, so he's got to get hot. Yeah. But uh, yeah, so he came up with the bases loaded against a really good team. The team that ended up winning the championship of the tournament. And I think at the time, it, it was like five to three or six to three. They were down, and he came up with the bases loaded, and he's one of their best hitters. And he flies out to the center fielder, and then when he gets back to the dugout, he realizes there's a huge crack in his bat. So. That wasn't that wasn't the best time to realize you had a big crack in your bat. So uh, we got to get him a new one. And I spent way too much money on it. So hopefully they'll give me a uh, they'll give me a replacement since I bought it in March. Yeah, I'm sure it's under warranty. He was wondering, Rob Clifton, where did Brady's power surge come from? Must be something in the Zach sauce. 
Uh, so could absolutely. Be. And I, uh, by the way, I, I mean, I say this. Uh, uh, I think I said this last week too. But yeah, I had Zaxby's again. Just had another hankering. Right, there we go. Nothing, nothing special. Nothing fancy. Just the chicken. It's always but, special. But uh, it was good. It was clutch. It was quick. Daddy likes. Third question from Rob Clifton. First off, I just want to say a great job on the draft, all things considered. It was comical to watch you all and everyone uh, do a great job. Uh, winner was Corey's team, which, again, I don't <laughs> Yep, that seems know. to be the overwhelming consensus. Corey can – whatever. Corey can do no wrong. This show really should just be everybody loves Corey is really what this show is just all <laughs> right. about. Uh, he asks me that my beard seems to have manifested into, into some sort of third-dimension aura. What is going on with it, bro? I'm just not going to shave my beard until I get my hair cut. So that's what's going on right now. Um, if you're afraid of uh, long-bearded Middle Eastern men, probably should steer clear of me. Fourth, Corey, on Friday's <laughs> show, you delved slightly into your thoughts on the lost decade. Will you please write a full detail, tell all article, or give us the juicy bits on that time period? I have followed FSU since 1987. I was 10 then and living in Colorado at the time. Uh, did not get all the tell-all stuff. I'm sure there are a lot of backhaul, dark alley slums of Shaolin insight you can provide. Thanks, Guy. Keep up the good work. Stay safe to the both of you. I have something to send both of you. PM me your address so I can send it to both of you. That's the sending thing. I'm excited about that, whatever that could be. Um, the guy for headlines made us uh, uh, made us all a, a really cool thing. That was neat. Uh, um, cool. That, well, I know this isn't the headline show, so I'll, I'll just I'll stop talking about it. But um, uh, the lost decade, Ira's the man for that. Like literally, Ira got there. Mm -hmm. I think his first year was oh one or oh two. Oh two. So he he didn't live through any of the good stuff. Yeah. And just got there in time for Chris Ricks' sophomore year. <laughs> that's where that's where Ira came into play. So if you want to blame anybody for the lost decade, how about that guy? Um, but he, I'm you know he was. He, he and Gene both would be much better at uh, detailing that because I didn't, I didn't move to Tallahassee until 07, and I really didn't start covering the football team full-time until 08. And by that time, you know, that, that they were already deep in the throes of the lost decade. But Ira and Gene would have a, a great perspective on that. Yeah. The only gossipy stuff I remember or know from that time was, I think it was I think Greg Jones and Darnell Dockett got into it in the locker room, and uh, Greg was victorious. Yeah, I don't know if it was in the locker room or on the field or in an apartment, but yes, Greg Jones, uh, by all accounts, won that. Yeah. But I'm not going to mock Darnell Dockett <laughs> nope. at all for that. Nope. Darnell, hey, buddy, it happens. Two big dudes get at it. The first guy that lands the punch is usually going to win it. Yep. I would never mess with either one of those dudes, quite obviously. Um, Darnell Dockett is a very tough person. So yeah. no shame, and if you're going to lose to a fight, to lose to that dude. And then I, there were stories about Jeff at bowl games being a little, maybe uh, not Jeff fully, Cameron. No, uh, no, Jeff Bowden, oh. not being fully dialed in. I guess you could maybe say. And then uh, apparently, my buddy told me this. Uh, actually, I knew one of the guys that held Bobby Bowden's headset through a mutual friend, and one time he delved into a whole bunch of stuff, and I forgot half of it because it was one of those nights. But what I do remember, and it wasn't him that told me this; it was someone else. Uh, apparently, Ricks that night when they played Clemson in 2003, when Florida State was ranked three, number their third team, uh, ranked third in the nation. That's what most people in America say when they're talking about teams being ranked in polls. Aslan, ranked three. Out. Yeah, everybody says they're ranked three. Yeah, uh, they were ranked third in the nation for that game, and uh, starting quarterback was on the phone with his girlfriend on the way to the game and was in distress and was crying uh, on the way to that game. So, and oh, you saw how that game right. kind of turned out. Okay. That okay. happened. Yeah, I mean that's that's something. There's there's plenty of story. Well, heck, there's stories like that for good teams. Yeah. Oh, the O three team was a good team. Um, but yeah, I think you know obviously the the real deal was was who was in charge, who was the OC, and you got kind of left behind because the, the 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 game was changing very quickly, and uh, Florida State wasn't really meeting that challenge of changing. Um, and you know we all we all saw it. We all saw what happened. On Friday, hopefully you all saw the happy hour that we did on YouTube live with Gene, Ira, myself, and Corey. And we got into a little bit of a discussion about the quarterback position because every time we do one of these shows, one of you folks feels obligated to call and ask us what we think about the quarterback position, even though they haven't really practiced in three months and we haven't seen anything from any quarterback since then. But you still want to know what we're going to do with the quarterback position. Um, and I got into talk about Chubba. 
Uh, I think somebody who called in has something to say about Chuba. And then we started talking about uh, he's got a brother, an older brother, Brock Purdy, who's done quite well at Iowa State. And then we started talking about siblings and what younger sibling has outshone, outshined their older sibling. And we didn't have a lot of good examples. So we took it to Twitter, and a lot started pouring in for examples. And I'm kind of disappointed in you for not coming up with this one, Corey. You didn't want to point out the fact that Mad Dog – Maddox had an older brother, Mike Maddox. Oh, yeah, there you go. And Mike Maddox was like a le- legitimate major league pitcher. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's a good one. Yeah, Greg Maddox was a lot better. There you go. So Chubba's the Greg Maddox of uh, college football. Somebody was saying, uh, also in the, cor- in the pitcher realm, Pedro Martinez, younger brother of Ramon Martinez. Mm-hmm. That's a good one. Uh, George Brett, football, younger. Are there like any quarterbacks? Who was the best Clawson? Oh, man. I know the kid that went to Notre Dame was the most hyped of all of them, but he didn't end up being much, did he? No, the oldest one was Jimmy, I think. Wasn't Jimmy the oldest one? I thought Jimmy was the youngest one. Was the youngest one? Casey was the oldest one. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Jimmy. Jimmy. Jimmy, Jimmy, Jimmy. Uh, We don't have a lot of quarterbacks, uh, but there's a lot of good examples people were throwing at us that I wanted to give people props on. But uh, someone someone actually said Stephen Drew over J.D. Drew. I don't know if that was – it was Denise. I don't know if she was being serious or she was just trolling me. I wouldn't say that. I wouldn't agree with that. Kyle they both Bush had similar. I think they both had similar major league careers. They were, you know, decent players. They were starters for a while. I think JD was probably a little bit better, but you know, JD went into the major. I mean, he was the Golden Spikes winner. I mean, he was he might be the best college baseball player of all time. Steven didn't quite live up to that, but he was really good. Um. Or was my favorite one? I just uh, eked out of my head there. Yeah, Barry Sanders apparently had an older brother that played at Oklahoma State. So that's a really good one. We like Barry Sanders. Uh, we've had different sports. Uh, someone says Kyle Bush better than Kurt Busch. Uh, then we have uh, Yaya Torre of Premier League Soccer, I'm thinking. Younger brother of Colo Torre was better. Jeremy, who calls in often, was talking about the UFC, John Jones. His older brother is Chandler Jones, defensive end. For I don't even know. I can't keep up. Uh, but he's quite a quite a talented defensive end. But John Jones is like arguably the best mixed martial arts fighter of all time. And then my favorite one uh, that really was open and shut, Charlie Sheen, better than older brother Emilio Estevez. Oh, I don't so, Not athletics, but still, you know. Good. I don't know about that. I think he is. I think Charlie Sheen was like a legitimate baseball player. Now, if you listen to him, he, he'll tell you that he, he probably threw 96 and – uh, could have signed with the Yankees out of high school. But I remember the, the story about Charlie Sheen was when he was doing Major League, he, like, roided up for it <laughs> no. so he could throw hard. Like, really? that's how much he cared about it. I think that's the story, that he, he was on uh, PED so he could throw hard. And I think he had to throw a lot. So, uh, um, oh, that was another thing that uh, – I, did you ever hear the – I can't remember if Kevin Costner was on uh, the Simmons podcast or some podcast – and he was talking about that movie he shot where it was uh, the For Love of the Game. Do you remember that? Uh, I I, remember, I didn't see the movie, but I've heard of it. I, He's I think like an aging podcast. pitcher with the Tigers. Yeah. And somehow Vin Scully is calling a Tigers-Yankees game. Whatever. They couldn't have just made it a Dodgers game. I hate when movies do that stuff. Like, Vin Scully's the Dodgers announcer. Why is he announcing a Tiger? And they don't ever explain it. But anyway, um, Costner said that because he had to throw so many pitches that um, – <laughs> I, I think he said something about the Yankees guy gave him this clear and this cream so he could recover quicker. No way. He's like, I, prob- he's like, I probably shouldn't be saying this, but he, and then he talked about how the, the, one of the Yankees training staff, I think he said Yankees, um, gave him some, some sort of stuff for his arm so he could throw harder and uh, recover quicker. That movie came out in 1999. I feel like that was right. Yeah. I'm going to go ahead and say this, Aslan. Spot. I mean, you might think I'm incorrect, but I think a lot of people were doing steroids in baseball around that time. I thought that movie was a lot older. I thought that was kind of like uh, I probably got switched up with Bull Durham in my head. Um, no, that's crazy, line. though. He did he did baseball movies 13, 14 years apart. He's just a natural. He's just a natural. Well, that was uh, Robert Redford. I'm telling you, man, Costner, man, if, if it's a cowboy movie or a baseball movie, he is all about it. Have you watched that show Yellowstone that he's on? I've heard really good no. things about it. I've I have too, it, but no, I haven't watched it. i got other stuff to watch. I got you. All right. Well, hey, um, let's talk about the top 10, the Warchant.com original uh, top 40, and we laid out the top 10 over the weekend. You can go check it out on Warchant.com. Use the promo code Warchant30, 
it's factored in with the opinions of myself, Corey, more importantly, and then Ira Schofel, managing editor, uh, Jeff Cameron of 97.9 ESPN Tallahassee fame, and then founder and administrator of Warchant.com, uh, Gene Williams, who I, we probably should have asked him to come on the show today to talk about how he created Warchant, how he got to this level, because uh, there's not a lot for me to talk about right now. But Let's anyhow, do that later this week. What's that? Yeah. I said, let's do that later this week. Well, later this week, we do the live show on mm-hmm. Tuesday, and then we do Renegade Express, where the people give us all their questions and make our lives easy. So there's that. Okay. Gotcha. Anywho. Fair. All right. So I should have let you know this so you can get your top ten out. I'll, I'll start off with my top ten. Um, number ten, Bobby Cooper. Bob Cooper. Robert Cooper. Robert Cooper was in everybody's top 21. I had him rated the highest on any on any individual list i had him again at number 10 big guy um, which is going to kind of come to bite me in the butt here when we argue closer to the top of the list in terms of how i'm ranking these guys Uh, i just feel like this defensive line is probably uh, i mean good grief can we say like the best segment in the conference that's crazy aslan don't say that miami's got that defensive end who's going to probably get 15 sacks I really like this defensive line, though, and I think Robert Cooper is going to be really good and really important part of it. I do like the defensive line as well. That's a little too high for me for him because uh, he's not a um, – he is a big deal. I don't, please don't take it the, uh, think that I'm dismissing what he does, but he's not a guy that's going to wreak havoc on quarterbacks. And I just think in 2020, I know you always got to stop the run. That's number one. That will always be the case. But, man, it's nice to get pressure um, – on quarterbacks, those are that's game changing, and uh, he's not a guy that's going to do a ton of that, but he fills his role really, really well. Um, so yeah, um, and that's the one issue with the Florida State defensive line that I still won't say that they're. I think they they probably have the best trio of interior linemen in the country, um, but I'm just I still worry about the edges a little bit. So that's why I wouldn't say that's why I'd go with Miami because you know those two defensive ends are gonna are gonna be uh, creating havoc in the backfield if they're healthy. Am I supposed to give my 10th now? I would appreciate it if you would. I think everybody at home would as well. I think I – I can't remember how I did this. I, I might be saying this name twice. I can't remember if I ended on him last week or not, but uh, Jashawn Corbin is my 10th. You did not. You did not. Okay, no. good. So he's, he is my 10th. Is he your starting running back, number one running back, most carries? He is, yeah. Okay. He is indeed. Was just I feel like he, that's fair for him, right? Well, the way he carried himself in those practices kind of showed you what he can – possibly be yeah man he was impressive I know and he was even slowed he wasn't 100 percent healthy and again that size and I know I should I it should be I should probably break down his film in high school and break down the starts he had against Texas State last year but just the fact that he's that big and he he returned kickoffs for A&M like of all the athletes on that team that's the dude that was returning kicks for Jimbo who cares a lot about special teams um, I think that's a, a really good sign about his uh, explosiveness I don't know. Is so that's why really he's flush I, I, I with think athletes. He has a chance though? to have a big year. Is A&M what? really flush with athletes, though? Come on, man! It's A&M. It's SEC. It's just any any school that's a Power Five school is going to have a bunch of dudes that can return kicks. A bunch of options. Yeah. Like, wouldn't you say? I don't know. Fifteen percent of the entire roster, maybe twenty, return kicks in high school at some point. So. You know, with that in mind, yeah, the fact that you're one of the top two, I, I think that means you're a pretty exceptional athlete at any Power 5 school. Um, and that Jimbo is a, it really does care about special teams. Uh, that, you know, that, I think that tells you something. Like, look who his kick returners were. He had Jalen Ramsey doing it. He had Derwin James doing it. Um, I can't remember if Rashad did it or not. I think Rashad did punts. And it was really yeah, I know he did good. punts. I couldn't remember if he did kicks at all, even when he was a freshman. But, yeah, he's always put really good athletes back there to return kicks, so that's a big deal to him. Yeah. Number nine. Uh, almost read the official list, which would have been foolish because I would have been giving it away for free. Number nine, Corey Durden. Uh, Corey Durden, uh, lowest rank on anyone's list was Ira's. Ira put him at 18th. I had him, again, obviously here at nine. I had him ranked the highest. Again, man, his defensive line seems to be really flipping good. Uh, yeah. And I, I just think he's he's going to create maybe that sort of havoc that you crave from your defensive lineman. I just think Robert Cooper's is going to be such a good, stout, point-of-attack guy uh, in terms of slowing down run attacks. That it's just going to free – it's going to make everyone else's life easier. And we're not going to see it. It's not going to flash on uh, film. 
uh, I think you know that's what he'll provide. But I think Corey Durden will will do more of that because he was in the backfield quite a bunch last season. So agreed, agreed. I think he's an NFL caliber player, uh, and it's always nice to have those on the line of scrimmage. Uh, my number nine, and it's not because of anything he's done so far in his career, but I just think his importance. If he if he becomes the player that we all hope he can be. Um, he could be a, a team changer. He could certainly be a defense changer, and that's Josh Kando. Ooh, wow. If he can look anywhere remotely like a five-star defensive end, and I know we're three or four years into his career now, so a lot of people might have punted already, but he has had injuries. He has been behind other really good players. Um, if he can make this – if he can have a breakout year, just think what that would mean to this defense. When you already have the other guys on that line of scrimmage, if you can have a dude – that big, uh, that can they can come off the edge and get into quarterbacks' faces and get those pressures that we're all so fond of. Uh, that could be a uh, that could be a really important cog in 2020. All right, who you got number eight? Darius Washington. Oh wow! Again, not that it's not the it's not the 40 best players. Although Darius might be, hey man, he might be the next Walter Jones. None of us know what Walter Jones looked like as an 18-year-old. He was at a junior college somewhere. So maybe this is, Darius Washington is going to turn into the next Walter Jones. But, um, man, that's, a, that's such an important position. And if he can just be average, wouldn't you say, if he could just be average, how much better the offensive line would be? Because what they've had at left tackle the last two years has been an abomination. So if this kid... Uh, who started a few games last year anyway as a true freshman, but still now is a, he, he got to red shirt anyway. Um, if he can get bigger, stronger, better, and turn into what? Just like a, a middle-of-the-road ACC offensive lineman. Be Brock that Rubel. would be a hu- huge step Be Brock step Rubel up. for us. Is that, can, 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 can we just ask for him to be Brock Rubel? Or should we set a higher bar? I feel like you could set a higher bar, uh, you know. But, yeah, but yeah, sure. Just don't be... Awful. If you're not awful, then the then just by that alone, the offensive line is going to be better because they've had to scheme around and block around awful left tackle play for uh, two or three years now. So just be just be average, and you're in. Uh, it'll be a huge upgrade. Whoever's flipping bottle caps, tell them to stop flipping. That's bottle me. Caps. That's me. Sorry. Knock it off. Sorry, buddy. Didn't know you could pick that up. <sighs> My ears, buddy, my ears. Only second to uh, President Obama's ears in terms of uh, scope, depth. I used, to have, I used to thought I had really big ears when I was a little kid, but I've really grown into them. That whole puberty thing treated me really well, man. Number eight. It did. Hey, it did, buddy. Yeah, yeah. Uh, number eight, DJ Matthews. Matthews, Matthews. I do want to sort of underscore your point here about, again, these are not the 40 most talented players or the 40 best players. These are players, I think, whose contributions, if they kind of fall in line and intersect with what we think their potential is, are going to have the biggest impact on this team and thus, you know, will be the most important parts in terms of this being a successful season. So a left a left tackle, again, if he can provide that sort of, you know, requisite level of resistance at that position, you just think that creates all sorts of good synergy for the rest of that offense. So, of, of course, if your left tackle is going to be uh, – an overachiever, uh, you know, in terms of what his recruiting grade was, or just, you know, provide a lift from what you've had the last three, four seasons, then that could probably lead to some some extra wins. So that's a that's a very good pick by you. Although I kind of gasped at it. Uh, number eight, DJ Matthews. Yeah, I just think DJ. I think I probably ranked him a little too high. Uh, I am. Uh, I did rank him the highest out of all of us at number eight. You had him the lowest at number twenty. I, I think on three receiver sides, I still think it's Pokey, Terry, and and I think DJ finds a home in the slot. And I think, you know, jet sweep stuff, I just for some reason I think it'll click a little bit better this year, hopefully. Maybe that improved the offensive line. Uh, we'll see, you know, his punt return ability, if he can maybe tap into what he did in 18 a little bit more. Uh, there's a his, He hasn't reached a ceiling, I don't think. I mean, we've seen the, the glimpses of it, more so than a guy like Josh Kando you talked about, I think. It's just whether he can put it together for an entire season. and It's probably a tough ask at this point in his career to think it's all going to come together. Uh, but, you know, uh, I, I would hope so. But uh, I probably overvalued him, but I did have him at number eight. Yeah, I think with, with DJ, uh, he's going to have to take a big step up to be a no, top ten 
important player on this team in as far as production. Yeah. And I say that all knowing what the what the offensive line play and the quarterback play has been the last two years. It has not been easy for anyone outside of uh, Tamori and Terry to make an impact at wide receiver. But he hasn't made a great impact. He hasn't been terrible. He's almost kind of just been so – I don't – average isn't the right word, just kind of steady – but not spectacular that you just almost forget. I almost forget sometimes. And I hate to say this. Oh yeah, he's coming back for a senior year, yeah. because he's just been kind of there. And that that sounds like an insult. It really, I really don't mean it like that. It's just he hasn't been able to make huge impacts other than the Miami play. And I think he had a huge catch against Louisville, like go climbing the ladder last year when uh, they went down for their. I think it was right before Terry's like walk in touchdown to take the lead where he had a huge play in that game, but he hasn't had a lot of memorable plays. Yeah. And so you kind of, this has to be it. And that, I don't think any of that's through his fault of his own. I think we all agree that he's a pretty talented guy. Um, you just hope this is the year it clicks with him in the offense and, and he can, you know, maybe have a bigger, I don't think he's had over, he's over 400 yards receiving in any season. So when you think about that, that's 30, 33 receiving yards per game. I mean, that's, that's just, that's nothing special to a place like Florida State, but the good news is he does have one more year to do some special things. So there you go, DJ. And something else, DJ, I'll tell you this. This new guy, this new coach, he's not going to he's not going to just sit around and let you not catch punts. You better go up and catch them or you're not going to be the punt returner anymore. And it's I'm I'm actually genuinely interested in who they who they look at at punt returner cuz yeah, DJ was, was had the big return against Miami. I think he'd done a, a he'd had other couple nice returns earlier in his career, but last year, man, it was 50-50 whether he was going to run up and catch it or let it bounce 20 yards past him. So hopefully, hopefully it's it's pounded into his head uh repeatedly at practice that uh man, you got to go catch everything you can. Yeah, maybe that's uh the subliminal sort of thing I was going with with DJ because again I, I think he's 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 a starter in your three receiver set I do have pokey at 15 so by virtue of that you would think I'm putting down DJ as a more productive wide receiver I just think he can do more things than pokey can and maybe he does give you that one punt return for a touchdown yeah uh, maybe he does get a reverse and get a big third down conversion against the Louisville team to uh, you know help get you a win on the road uh, so I mean, those are the, I think I think the big playability with him is is more prevalent than Pokey. So that's why. I well, and that's idea. why uh, in my list I had I had DJ twenty. I had Keyshawn Helton eighteen. I just feel like that those are similar roles. But I understand your concern about Helton coming off the uh, the injury. We don't know if he's going to be a hundred percent healthy. Although you know apparently he's way ahead of schedule. You hear that all the time. But I feel like they have similar value to the team. I don't know that. Keyshawn hasn't proven he can be like a possession third down guy maybe as much as – is well, no, not maybe. He definitely hasn't proven that. But I think when he's proven he can do some things with the ball in his hands. Yeah. So uh, I wonder how those two guys play off each other and if they play the same position, if they're both on the field at the same time. Um, that's something I look forward to seeing moving forward, how they how they use both those guys. Who you got My number – where are we at now? Number? Seven. Seven? Yeah. I'm going to go seven and six. Ooh. Back right. to back, Go ahead, because make up the number seven, number seven is Chubba Purdy, and number six is James Blackman on my list. Mm. And basically, it's a cop out. It's hedging my bets, but I do think one of those guys is going to be the starting quarterback, and that's a kind of important position. So that's oh, why I ranked him. I don't know who's going to be it. I think uh, two years ago I ranked like Francois two and Blackman three or something like that because we just didn't know. But it's such an important position that I, I, I put them both up in the top 10 thinking one of them is going to win the job. And I guess when I did the list initially, I must have thought Blackman had a 1% chance of, 1 better chance of being the starting quarterback because I put him at 6 and Chubb at 7. But right, I think I've changed my mind now. Sorry, I keep messing with that bottle cap, Aslan. I, keep, uh, I think I've changed my mind now, and I think I, I, think I leaned to Purdy 51-49. to 49. <sighs> And quarterback is just so important, and you just, your mind wants to race at what it would look like if Florida State had a good quarterback again. You know, hasn't been all that long. I mean, I think Francois in sixteen was a good quarterback. Um, but yeah, if one of these guys can give you like a Francois esque season, I think nine wins is definitely uh, a realistic goal, a possibility, a probability. Dare I say? I just said it. Probability. As long as uh, they're not like. Uh 
disregarding uh, handshakes from their left tackle after they get sacked again. Not a yeah. handshake. Hey, man, let me pull you up. And they do the, the, the flip. Like, man, I'm tired of you helping me up. Number seven, we, speaking of, uh, Dante Lucas. That had to be one of Francois' five most memorable moments, right? Or ten? Just the jerk around, like like rolling over quickly. Like, man, quit trying to help me up. How about blocking someone? And I get it. We don't want our quarterbacks to do that necessarily, to show up their offensive linemen and to show their frustration. But at the same time, I think we all understand it too. Right. Like enough is enough, man. That's the 12th time I've been hit because of you. And you just stand there and hold your hand out to pick me up again. How about blocking someone? I understood that. I understood that uh, sentiment as well. Anyway, sorry I interrupted. Go ahead. You're fine. Uh, seven, the Pope, Dante Lucas. Okay. And then six, uh, Sante Samuel Jr. Uh, at number six. So that's, that's, that's my seven, six, bang, bang. Those two yeah, really good I'll go players. ahead and talk about Lucas now. I have him, I have him higher. Um, the only reason I have him higher than that, and we can just talk about it now, he's, he, look, he's the best lineman on the team. And I think, man, it, it, he just has the nasty streak, right? right. We've seen it. Yeah. Uh, he, he, has that, he has that in him. He has confidence. He's strong as a bull. He's nasty. And maybe, just maybe, he can infect the other linemen with some of that nastiness. Like, they rise to him. I've seen it happen. I, bl- I brought this example up a million times in the last five years. But Jalen Ramsey in 2015 affected that entire defense with just how nasty he was. The whole defense changed from 14 to 15. Even though they lost all those dudes, they were better in 15 than they were in 14 because Jalen Ramsey just, he, you know, a, a wide receiver tried to block him on a little bubble screen. No, man, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw you into the sideline. Mm. Like he just played with such, uh, uh, I don't know, vigor and, and uh, just rage, determination to just go punish people. And I think Dante Lucas is that can be that guy where they feed off of him. I, they they just that that position group that segment that position room they just need somebody to rally around. And if this can be the guy, he might end up being the most important player on the team if they can follow his lead. Now they're not going to be him uh, athletically or physically, but they can try to play like him. And, and maybe he can raise the level of the guys around him. I don't know if that happens with offensive linemen, but I think it does. I'm not. It's not basketball where Magic Johnson turns guys into all all stars, but I think he can raise their level, and that's what they need. They need a. They need somebody to follow, man. And and I know he's just a true sophomore, but he strikes me as the guy that can can be that guy. Absolutely. Absolutely. Who you got number five? Let's go to the top five, Corey. Let's go to the top five, Corey. Uh, you mentioned him already, Asante Samuel. Okay. So you have him at six. Kids, the truth. He's he's the uh, six was Blackman, and then uh, I'm saying I, I had him Asante at six. Samuel. I had him at six. You had him at five. Oh yeah, we're right there, buddy. Everybody had Asante in their top six. Myself, Corey, obviously, uh, Gene, Ira, and um, Jeff Cameron as well. So yeah, he was uh, he was really good. David Hale uh, last week had some uh, you know those crazy in depth ESPN numbers where they have like the QB ratings for the for for cornerbacks and how many completions they gave up. Uh, yeah in attempts and everything. And I know that uh, quarterbacks completed less than 50% of their passes when throwing to Asante's guy. Their quarterback rating was like the second lowest in the conference. Um, I think he gave up one touchdown, either one or zero, uh, according to the ESPN uh, numbers. He just had a, he had a really, really good season. It's not like the days of Dion and Buckley anymore where, you know, a guy, a cornerback makes incredible highlight reel plays every, every week. Um, to be to win the Thorpe, like didn't a guy have recently win the Thorpe with like one pick? But this guy is a straight cover corner, and I'm telling you, man, watching him cover Tamari and Terry in those three days that we got to watch in the spring, man, it's hard to imagine any corner in the country would cover that dude better because they matched up. A, you remember that, right? I mean, yeah, they matched up a lot together, and it wasn't just an eleven on eleven where he, you know, oh, he might have had safety help or he read the quarterback. It was, it was a lot of one-on-one stuff, too. And he ran for, with him stride for stride. To, Terry obviously has a size advantage, but Asante Samuel didn't let that bother him at all. Um, he, is, he is another dude that you hope is like Dante, like that the other cornerbacks rally around. Uh, he's, just a, he's a really good player. He's a talker. He's good, and he knows he's good. And he's also, uh, I feel like he's a real student of the game, too. Like Akeem Dent. I think Akeem Dent 
can learn so much from Asante Samuel. And I think Akeem Dent's going to be really good, too. Mm-hmm. I like it. I like it. I couldn't find out uh, the, interception the interception stat about Thorpe win- award winners, but uh, point taken, yeah. Just, but uh, you know what I mean? Like, it, yeah. you know, Buckley had 12 in one year. I think Dion had five or five his senior year, but also had punt returns. And he just – they make flashy, flashy, game-changing plays. Asante, that's the one thing Asante hasn't done. Um, I think he had, I think he had 14 breakups last year or something. He, I think he was top 10 in the country in pass breakups. If he can turn a few of those in interceptions, those can be more game changing, but either way, his main job is to not give up completions and not give up touchdowns. And he did that almost as well as anyone in the, uh, conference last year. Uh, I was going to pull up the stats from, uh, what you call it pro football focus, but I, you know, can we even trust these people anymore? Can we? Can we even trust you folks after you said four? I don't know, buddy. I don't know. All right. Uh, number five for me is uh, Jay Sean Corbin for okay. reasons you outlined earlier. And four, I have Laburn, Kalen Laburn. Oh, so you did just, the quarterback, the thing I did with quarterbacks. I just think it's going to be a very run sort of uh, <clears throat> dependent offense. And I'm not necessarily saying, uh, again, I don't think this necessarily means. I think both – I'm not trying to say that both these guys are going to get – I don't even know the, what the carries would be, like 190 carries each. And I don't think, I don't think, I don't think we're going to have two guys flirting with, um, you know, 1,000 yards per se. But I just think that they will spell each other in ways and games where we'll see just how good the other is. It, it's going to be one of those sort of, man, like how come they just don't feed, you know, labor in all the darn time? And then he might have a bad spell. And then Corbin will come in and, and wow, and then vice versa. Uh, and again, I just think like uh, that's kind of why I had Sheffield so high. Just like I think if like, you're a third string running back and you come in on a third down and you catch a big pass on a third down to help ice a game or to uh, or to to help you know advance the ball down the field and get a field goal to to win a game, like those sort of things uh, are are really important to the overall success of a team. Now you might be like, well, why would a third string running back be in uh, on, in a fourth quarter drive? You never know. Things happen. Weird things happen. I just think both those guys are going to be quite instrumental uh, in the overall success of the offense. And I just – Laburn, man, just – he's he's a year – full year removed from the injury, whereas – or two years now, I guess. No, a year. Whereas Corbin is, is a little a little fresher. And uh, it's payday for, for Kalen, so I think it's it's get busy living time for him. So that's why I have him higher than Corbin. Okay. All right. Yeah, I mean, I, I get it. I, I'm, I'm, I'm starting to – meander over to the mindset like the NFL teams about drafting running backs. It's almost like plug and play unless you're special. But they just had a special dude leave here in Cam Akers. He was a big deal. And the dude he replaced was really special. So there's no reason to think that one of these two guys can't be special. And if they are, if they're not just a – you know how you sit with me in the press box all the time and I say he got the least amount of yards he could have possibly gotten out of that. Right. right. Like I would say that with a 21-yard pass over the middle. It's like, man, make one guy miss. Make one special play, and that's a 60-yard play. Um, and that's what I want to see out of these two guys. Because, you know, quite honestly, neither one of them has really proven it at the college level um, for different reasons, but they haven't. But did they have that in them where they turn – like the line blocks everything perfectly. It's a great design play. It's a 14-yard run with anybody on the roster. It's a 14-yard run. Okay, well, will one of these guys turn that into a 50-yard run by bouncing off a guy or making a safety miss? Um, you know, whatever you got to do. Um, I want to see that out of these guys. All right. I like it. I like it, Corey. Who you got? Uh, for? Number four for me is Hamsa. Ooh. Ooh. Yep. Man. Got him really high. Um, again, it's all about the injury, but I, you just, I mean, the guy's had 200 tackles combined the last two years. Um, he's had, I think, four interceptions. He's a, a physical freak. And again, you hope he's not Jalen Ramsey. He's not as good as Jalen Ramsey, but man, he is a physical dude. And maybe uh, they now they haven't taken the, they haven't following f- followed his lead the last two years necessarily. But I blame that more on scheme and coaching than I do uh, obviously Hamsa. Maybe Hamsa can be a leader, a senior leader, and they follow his lead and they see how their potential early round pick at safety how he punishes people and goes all out on every play, every rep, and they follow his lead. And that could be, that could be invaluable uh, with, with linebackers and, and with the secondary. Like, okay, if that guy's going to hit that hard, if he's going to play that physical and loose, then I am too. 
And I'm not just going to wait and catch tackles. I'm not going to wait and catch blocks. I'm going to go inflict pain. And I, Hamsa uh, tries to do that. All right, here we go. Top three. I don't think we have the same three players, but uh, probably in some Well, Don, I already gave mine away. Dante Lucas is my third. Wow. So you go ahead with your wow. third. Wow. On Hamsa, uh, Corey, Gene, and Ira all had Hamza in their top four. Myself and Jeff had him at 13 uh, because we realized that the okay. human body just – you know, need some time to recover from things every now and then. Uh, I don't think you'll appreciate Hamza. I think he's overlooked because the defense was so bad last the last two years, but not because of him. Right. Well, that's the thing. It's like when your safety – isn't that like a bad sign when your safety leads a team in tackles? It's a bad sign about the defense, but it's not yeah. a bad sign for him. Oh, yeah, yeah, like yeah, he, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? I get what you're saying, but, yeah, he comes up and makes plays, and he was the only one for some games that seemed like that wanted to – I mean, he had like 14 tackles in a game. Like, he, he, he definitely goes out there looking to make plays, and hopefully more guys can start doing that kind of thing. The thing, Corey, I don't know what I don't know. I think that's something that people popularize a lot here in recent memory. So when we talk about this defense, there's nothing about it that's been impressive or even remotely uplifting for me. And we'll get to that in a minute here. Well, then why is this guy ranked where he's ranked? Like, but I, I, I know what I don't know. And everybody says how awesome Marvin Wilson is, uh, whether it's pro football focus, whether it's the Walter Camp preseason list, whether it's a sporting news preseason list. Uh, I mean, everybody says how awesome Marvin Wilson is. I'll trust them. I'll trust them. Uh, and I guess I have to get to a point where I have to trust uh, what everybody says about Hamsa. It's just, yeah, I mean, just he's, he's making all the tackles, but there's there's been nothing good or redeeming about this defense, so it's just hard for me to, like, l praise any part of this defense, although I have, like, five of these guys in my top ten, and I just gushed about how good Asante Samuel is. You might be right on this one, Corey. You just might be right. Maybe Hamza will be top three, top five sort of talent. So you want to start with your top three, or you want me to go? Uh, well, I already, like I said, I already did Dante, so you do your number three. Chubba Purdy, uh, Preston Purdy, as his friends okay. call him, uh, weighed 32 pounds when he was one year old. That's Im that's impressive. That's a hearty young man, is it not? Wait, what? Yeah. Oh, not when he came out, when he was a year old. Yeah, yeah. Come, come okay. on. I mean, oh, my God. I was like, what? Yeah. I don't think he'd get dilated that big, you know? <laughs> no, I don't know how that would happen. Yeah. What, what what could you even do? Still, though, I mean, if even if you weigh, like, eight pounds at birth, that's a pretty decent-sized kid. I mean, he goes and you know, quadruples his weight in 12 months. I don't know. Is that what most babies do? I don't know. That sounds as excessive to me. But I don't know. I've never had a child. That's but, yeah, I got Chubba Purdy at number three. I just think he'll probably maybe be your starting quarterback, and that's a big deal. Uh, well, I mean, if just he's not the starting quarterback, then you really overvalued him. Well, if, yeah, he certainly yeah. won't be the third most important player. Yeah, I'm all in on him. I'm all yeah. in on him. I should, I should not uh, – you know, hedge and hem and haul. Uh, I think but again, right, isn't isn't the thinking with a list like this, like either way he's really important. Like if he's not good enough to beat out James Blackman, well, that's a really important development. Yeah. Not yeah, maybe in your eyes, yeah. not in the eyes of like the good of the football team, but that it, what, how his development is incredibly important for the Florida State football program because if he's as good as his brother, if he's better than his brother, if he's uh, – who would we say? Pedro, if he's Greg Maddox, Greg Maddox yeah. or Pedro Martinez, then that will be an enormous development for not only this team but for the program. So that's why he's important either way. You really can't be wrong. If he doesn't start at all, that's an important development. If, he's, if he turns out to be a, a, a kid that never plays here, that's very important. Not in, not in a good way, but it is important, right? It's uh, like uh, keep Luke well, I won't even I won't even make that comparison. Yeah, don't but, uh, go there. I don't even know where you're going to go, but don't go there. Yeah, I, I was going to go I mean, like uh, Times most important person of the 20th century. Ah, uh, I got gotcha. you. But I'm not going to mention it. So let's let's move on. Uh, I mean, just think. I just think <clears throat> if you make a throw against Virginia, if you get a first down against Wake Forest, if you don't turn the ball over an excessive amount against Arizona State and El Paso, you got nine wins. Right, I mean, Florida State's a nine and four football team. If he can come in, and I don't want to dog James. I don't. I don't know really know how many games were won by James Blackman uh, last season. So, I think you bring a quarterback in that can manage the game a little bit better than James and make a few more plays than James made last season. You're going to see a significant bump in your win total, and that's a huge part of your success. And you're important by virtue of that. So, I have him at number three. And then uh, number two, I've got Marvin Wilson, man. 
So everybody knows who that means. I have it number one. I've got Marvin at two. Who do you have at two? I have the other guy at number two. I have Tamari and Terry, okay. um, only because he's behind Marvin. But, um, look, I've been on this guy's train really since I saw him as a true freshman uh, in the one open practice that uh, Jimbo had in 17. And we all wondered, Way, wow, why isn't this guy on the field? But, um, you know, what he's done the last two years – in a in a not great offense with not good quarterback play and with a bad offensive line is uh and just, not a lot of help on the other side of the field exactly either. right there's nobody else that i mean they can shift a lot of their coverage to him and it does not matter he's got like i think he's his touchdown average yards per out you know yards per touchdown average is like 50 in his career which is the second highest in the last 15 years uh, it, it just what he does, we almost take for granted. And I know, um, you know, oh, he, he's dropped a few passes here. He didn't have a good game here or there. Man, my man, my man had 1,200 yards receiving last year for that offense with those quarterbacks thrown to him with no other real weapons uh, besides the running back. So imagine what he can do in an offense that might be able to uh, – and not that Kendall Bryles doesn't know what he's doing, but uh, maybe an offense that can get him in more uh, – advantageous situations are more one-on-one -on -one situations um and not only that say he does consistently uh require double teams and they do shift a, a lot of their focus to him well that's really important too yeah you go into the 2020 season with the best best big play threat in the country and legitimately one of the best big play threats florida state's ever had maybe the best as far as just straight down the line i'm going to throw it up go make a play I don't think Florida State's ever had a guy like this. Obviously, I'm not saying he's better than Peter Warwick, Rashad Green, Anquan Bolden, those guys. Trust me, I know all those names. My man Bolitnikoff. Yeah, that's right. Uh, Ron Sellers. Yeah, that's right. Jingle Joints. Mm -hmm. just, just making plays. I'm not saying he's in their category yet, but as far as pure down-the-field threat, deep threat, he's probably the best. Him and, I don't know, Jesse Hester? I don't know. It, 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 just look at his numbers. The fact that his, he's got four... He already has the FSU record for most touchdown catches over 70 yards, and he's, he's played two years um, with not good quarterbacks. So this guy is a freak. Enjoy him. And he is going to be a huge part of your offense just because he's on the field. That's just how it is. And he's a good blocker when he wants to be. I mean, he is a devastating blocker when he wants to be. And he got noticeably bigger um, in the offseason. I think he gained, I don't know what he said, 8 to 10 pounds of muscle. So, um, and he kept coming back for his junior year when he could have, he definitely could have been drafted. Um, I think that's, again, that, that he's a very, very important part of this team. I want to ask you a question here, Corey, uh, to maybe okay. illuminate uh, why we picked who we picked and, and why we put them at the spots on, on one and two here. And I'm probably going to do a clumsy job of this because I didn't script it out, which I should have because I realized we were going to get to this point. It's October 10th. You're playing Clemson. Like, would you rather be trailing 24 to 20 and the ball is, you know, on the nine yard line, first down, 43 seconds, and you got two timeouts left? Would you rather be down four or would you rather be up four and Clemson has the ball in that same position? Like Their me, own just, nine? Well, the opposing, you know, the opposing nine in the red zone, first and goal, nine yard line. Oh. Oh no! I think you'd rather be. I think you'd rather be on offense. Yeah. and that's why I pick Tamori and Terry, just because of the way the f the game of football, the sport of football, is played in this day and age. I just think like the guy on offense is more valuable to you than a guy on defense. This is not twenty twelve Alabama where you know everything is loaded, and then you have maybe like you know uh, Mount Cody or whoever they had defensive tackle in twenty twelve. Like if. I just think like a receiver is going to give you more sort of bang for your buck in this day and age with the way this team is built uh, and with the way the schedule is sort of laid out. Not to take anything away from Marvin. I mean, this is like 99.9% .9 to 99.89%. Uh, and, I, and I probably just did it to be a little bit of a contrarian because I figured all of you probably put Marvin at number one. Yeah, but it's it, the difference between their importance to me is negligible on the field. Um the off-the-field stuff with Marvin isn't even necessarily what happened a, a couple weeks ago because I think we did this, at least I sent my ranking in before that happened, I think. Um, 
maybe not. But either way, it's it's the way you, they talked to, the way Taggart talked about him last year, and what a leader he was. And I don't think that was coach speak. I think that dude has more respect in the locker room than anybody else on the team, maybe by a wide margin. Because he's the hardest, he's one of the hardest workers. I shouldn't say the hardest, because who knows? How do you measure that? He's one of the hardest workers, and he's also a guy that turned down millions of dollars, at least a million dollars, probably a couple million dollars, to come back to school. I think that's really like Tamari and Terry. I don't. I mean, he might have been a third round pick. Maybe Marvin's a second round pick this year or late first round. We know both of them would have been picked, but I think we all thought Marvin Wilson was gone. Yeah. Yeah. But the Tamari, we were kind of 50-50 or 60-40. I thought Marvin was 99-1. Like, I thought he was done. He was gone. So for him to come back, what that says about him, what that, what that says the university means to him, getting his degree means to him, I just think beyond the enormous impact he has on a football field because he's unblockable by one dude, typically, um, and he creates just – he's a, he's a, a – uh, just a monster in the middle of the defense, and you have to game plan for him. It's what he does uh, just with, with with other players on the team, with a roster. You give them a uh, an example to follow. I've, I've said this example, too, forever. People are going to stop listening to this show because I just keep see, using the same examples over and over. But what Tony Douglas did for the basketball team in 2009, he set a, he set a standard. That, that team in 2009 that went to the tournament for the first time in a decade and played for the ACC championship, you know, that was a team with six freshmen on it. And they saw that dude. They saw Tony Douglas working harder than anybody else on the team. Was there before the coaches got there? Was there after everybody left? They saw that. They were inundated that for, with that for nine months. Okay, that's how we – that's the standard. That's the Florida State way. That's the leader. That's who we have to be like. And that carried on for years, the Tony Douglas effect. Just, yeah, I remember how Tony practiced? That's how we're practicing. And I think Marvin Wilson can have a similar impact um, to these new guys. And that, that is invaluable when you're, building a, when, when you're a new coach trying to build your own program, to have a guy like that that they can look up to. That's, the only reason, that's why I had him at number one. Also, he's an awesome defensive tackle. Let me revisit it. Would you rather be down for first and goal – for Florida State on the Clemson nine, or would you rather be holding on to a four point lead and Clemson has the ball on their own twenty five? You've just touched it back, or they've just a fair catch, and they've got it minute and a half and two timeouts. I think you always want the ball in your hands, yeah, right? Yeah, that's that's that's. Yeah. It's like, I think it's like being the home team in in baseball. Yeah, you always want a chance to win it. Yeah. Um, yeah. And there's a little bit of durability there, too. Terry's been available uh, every single game he's played, or been available, he's been able to play uh, since the red shirt got pulled off him. So we'll see how it all goes out when they hopefully play football. Uh, we're not going to opine on when that's going to happen or if it's going to happen and all that kind of stuff. But uh, we're a day closer to at least like MLB and the NBA, so that's a pretty encouraging thing. Uh, if you only knew what we overcame to get the show done today, everybody, at least Corey, having to deal with all the I had to overcome a lot, folks. Yeah, just – I hope I, I hope Brady I hope Brady witnesses some of this stuff that you undergo and endure. You know, I just think that'll really. Usually, really... when I'm recording up in Georgia, he's in his room playing Xbox, uh, you know, playing Fortnite or something. Gotcha. Um, so no, he didn't. Uh, Stephanie got to see see it oh, though right. firsthand. Just the just you know, people don't. Qu I don't think people quite understand what I deal with. All right, to to, take it over to like entertain that. them to entertain the masses. But it's, folks, it is a grind. It is a soul-sucking siege. I feel, I feel a little bit attacked. I'm going to cut you off here. <laughs> cut you off here. We'll be back, Renegade Express, on Friday. So, for Corey and Maslow, thanks for listening to Wake Up War Champ, presented by Zaxby's indescribably good. Warchant.com is the ultimate inside source for FSU football and recruiting. And now you can get in on the action for free for an entire month. Warchant.com is offering a risk-free 30-day trial subscription. Get full access to the number one website covering the Seminoles just by entering the promo code WARCHANT30. That's WARCHANT30. Sign up and get in on the world's most active FSU message boards. Receive breaking news, stories from our award-winning staff, plus get exclusive interviews and videos. Just enter the promo code WARCHANT30. Warchant.com, your ultimate Seminole sports source.